It's been 16 years since Rocky V left a shaky mark on the otherwise perfect Rocky franchise. Sylvester Stallone has been open about how much he dislikes the franchise's fifth installment, and I'm sure you can see how that made this particular production personal. The ultimate makeup to redeem the franchise by ending it properly. Enter Rocky VI. Wait, it's not called Rocky VI? Why not? It's called Rocky Balboa? Why? Why ruin the perfect symmetry that was the Roman numerical titling? Well, apparently it's because so much time had passed since Rocky V that it was felt this one stood on its own. There's also the case of the parody musical called Rocky VI from the 80s that was titled as such to parody Rocky IV at the time by reversing the I and the V. It was also because it was meant to be the final send-off for the character and adding Rocky's last name epitomized that. Stallone stated this point, in fact, even with the Creed films coming later, that explanation stands as it was the end of Rocky being the centerpiece of the saga. In a way, it was a reboot of the franchise and a good deal of time before that became popular. It had been 30 years since the release of the original film after all. Bill Conti returned to compose the score. Stallone initially wanted Roy Jones Jr. to play the role of the antagonist Mason the Line Dixon, but RJJ never returned his calls. Thus, Antonio Tarver was pinged for the role. Speaking of the cast, most of the OGs return. Even more obscure ones like Pedro Lavelle as Spider Rico. Stu Nahan, a ringside announcer from the first four films, commentates the CGI fight for ESPN. He passed away a year later, rest in peace. Many real-life personalities appear throughout the film. There is one character who does not return, and it affects the film big time. We'll address that in the summary. So, what's up with this one? Can Stallone do the impossible and end Rocky's story on a high note? His track record says yes, but the sting of Rocky V cast out. Rocky Balboa opens with an interesting visual of the events to come in the film through the lens of the Rocky title card. Mason Dixon is established as the heavyweight champion of the era, but his heart and merit as a champion are called into question by the boxing world. We're brought back to the original setting with the Frank Stallone, take you back, do 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 do, take you back, jingle. There couldn't have been a better return. Rocky is now 60 years old and living a quiet life as a restaurant owner. The establishment is named after his late wife, Adrian. Yeah, you heard that right. Adrian passed away off screen and you really feel Rocky's grief because we knew and loved her too. It was a brilliant decision in hindsight and this is the character I mentioned earlier who didn't return. Rocky's battles include the grief of having lost Adrian in a strained relationship with his now adult son who is no longer played by Sage Stallone. Paulie is guilt-ridden over how he treated Adrian and hates how Rocky is living backwards. The movie further tugs at your heartstrings with flashbacks to wholesome moments from earlier in the franchise, like Rocky and Adrian's first date. When Rocky says that he has that beast inside of him that's eating away at him, you can really feel it. For us fans, that beast is probably more so the fallout of Rocky V. Another OG returns in Little Marie, yeah, the teenage girl from the first film who said screw you creepo, to Rocky, has become a mature mother. Of course, a reveal like this makes the work print of Rocky V non-canon, given she's in that with a trash life. I digress. Rocky and Marie even joke about that moment from the original film, and Rocky meets her son. Mason Dixon, burdened by the deep-cutting criticism, seeks advice from his old trainer who brought him up. A fictional program akin to my own Boxing What If series catches the eye of all the characters. It showcases a CGI rendition of Rocky vs. Mason, and Rocky wins. As mentioned in the 70s timeline, this was inspired by the super fight between Muhammad Ali and Rocky Marciano, and the movie directly references it. This coupled with the predictions of some analysts is the last straw for both Balboa and Dixon. See, Rocky catches it too, and here's how some analysts think he was overrated. Some familiar beats are hit from the original film, like Rocky's awkward charm wearing away at Marie, as it did to Adrian 30 years earlier. 
Speaking of which, the film has an unspoken degree of there being a mild romantic flair between Rocky and Marie. I never noticed this until someone brought it up years afterward. Is it creepy? Remember Rocky asking her if she had a boyfriend in the first film? Kind of puts it in a new light, huh? Of course not. No, I'm just kidding. Let's not make something out of nothing here. It's all good to adults. Rocky gets a dog that everyone thinks is ugly, old, and probably dead. Balboa can see more, however, and it's clear the dog is a metaphor for how he sees himself as still having some mileage in him. It's also a reminder of how he was the only one who could see the beauty in Adrian back in the day. The dog's name is Punchy. Very telling. Side note, we see Paulie painting a portrait in the meat factory, and yes, it's the same meat factory. Could it be that Paulie painted the portrait of Rocky and Apollo from Rocky III? He even stands in front of it while holding his own portraits after he's fired from the meat plant. I'm just spitballing here. Rocky determines to start training again in effort to fight, and of course everyone thinks he's nuts. Rocky seeks a boxing license again from the Pennsylvania State Athletic Commission and is denied on the basis of his age. He gives a passionate rebuttal speech about unfinished business and being unjustly denied. He secures his license. Before we move on, it's said Rocky passes all his physical tests. So Rocky V isn't canon? It has to be canon because Rocky is back in Philly without his fortune. Well, according to Stallone, Rocky was misdiagnosed back in Rocky V and never sought a second opinion. Well, that sucks. Rocky really could have fought Union Kane back then and regained his life back. Big bummer in hindsight. Mason's team convinces him to fight Balboa as a means of recovering the champ's image. Rocky convinces Marie to work at his restaurant as they continue growing closer. Dixon's team visits the restaurant and offers Rocky an exhibition with the champ. Marie convinces Rocky that he's on the right path and he goes through with it. As Robert attempts to talk Rocky out of fighting on the back of living in his father's shadow, Rocky comes back with probably the most motivational speech in history. It ain't about how hard you hit, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. Robert quits his job with the abusive boss and joins his father's efforts. Duke returns to train Rocky for the fight and hasn't missed a beat. The obligatory training montage ensues and it too has not missed a beat in the years the franchise has been dormant. Rocky even drinks eggs and hits the slabs of meat again. It ends with him climbing those same steps where it all began, and in the snow this time at that. Bit of a fusion of Rocky 1, 2, and 4. At the pre-fight, Mason pulls Rocky aside and tells him he'll take care of him. But if Rocky goes off script and hurts him, he'll get him out of there. Rocky doesn't back down. Marie visits Rocky to give him a picture of Adrian to keep him safe and gives him a kiss. The HBO coverage of the fight does well to make this all feel like a real pay-per-view from the 2000s. Mason gets into it with Mike Tyson at ringside before the bout. Good to see the recently retired Iron Mike. As for the fight, it's awesome. Michael Buffer's announcing really gets you pumped and ready. Uh, let's get ready to rumble! If old George Foreman shocked the world with one punch, why can't old Rocky Balboa? Despite being outclassed, Rocky continues to take it to the champ. His training for power pays its dividends as Mason reflects on Rocky having bricks in his gloves. Dixon tastes the canvas after an assault from Rocky on the back of the champ breaking his hand. The montage of the fight feels like a fusion of one from Rocky 2 and 3 with Rocky 4. Maybe the fight is as good as it is because they got some real hits in there. I think Tarver actually knocks Stallone out during the filming. We even get some flashback images of Adrian at ringside and Mickey in Rocky's corner. Rocky makes it to the final round against all odds, again. He survives a knockdown that, now that I'm paying attention to, reminds me of the revision to Rocky IV he made in the director's cut where he tells himself to breathe while down. He rises to trade with the champ and wins the final exchange. In the end, the beast has been exercised for both men. Rocky has finished his business and Mason has bounced back. 
Mason wins by split decision just as Apollo did 30 years earlier. However, again, the result is irrelevant. It was about going the distance one last time and putting all demons to rest. Rocky visits Adrian's grave to give her the good news and tell her, Yo, Adrian, we did it. Rocky walks off, out of focus in the background from the flowers on the grave, and fades out. The character has been given his flowers and properly retired. The beast of Rocky V has been laid to rest. The credits include fans climbing the Rocky steps, something Stallone included by request. I'd like to say that this one is very special to me personally. Back in 2006, a nine-year-old boy was a huge fan of Rocky. He'd seen the first five films and was blown away by the news that he would get to see a Rocky film in the theater. He begged his parents to get him all five films on DVD so he could binge watch them at will and not just when they came on TV. That same boy had been mystified by Rocky IV at his grandma's house, as was mentioned in the 80s timeline. Of course, the boy is me. I remember going to see Rocky Balboa after watching all five films beforehand. I was fortunate to be on Christmas break at the time, so no homework or school night to screw me out of my destiny. We went to the theater as a family, and it was awesome. My parents enjoyed the nostalgia that came from the callbacks, but also embraced how well the movie stood on its own. So did I. I remember the sound booming in the theater and the movie looking so new and crisp in comparison to the first five. Everything was on point. It was my moment to enjoy a great franchise I would have been otherwise born too late to enjoy on the big screen. As soon as the movie hit home media, we picked up the DVD and I still have that copy some 17 years later. It wasn't the sequel we necessarily needed or even deserved, but damn am I proud of Sly for putting a last dance together for his magnum opus. It was the perfect send-off, and the existence of the Creed spin-offs somehow doesn't diminish it. In fact, they add to it. Rocky Balboa did the impossible and knocked everything out of the park. 16 years well worth the wait, and the cloud of Rocky V has been banished. Though again, I will say that the work print of Rocky V may be on par with the rest of the franchise. Give it a watch. As far as Rocky Balboa goes, it truly ain't over till it's over. You should be used to hearing that by now. The 2000s seems to bleed and breathe this.